last week, we uh, previewed uh, how RTA trends change as a function of permeability and fracture conductivity. And then we covered three signatures that are visible in an RTA plot, namely interference between clusters and no flow boundaries, uh, the prominence of flowing or dropping below bubble point, and uh, PDP or pressure dependent permeability. This week, uh, I'm going to focus on relative permeability, which is a particularly critical aspect of history matching production in simulations. And one of the areas that we feel is most challenging uh, in a history match. And so we've spent a lot of time thinking about the right approach to trying to history match using relative permeability curves. So as a very quick review, uh, uh, most people on the, the call probably are familiar with relative permeability, but the concept of relative permeability is it is a multiplier to the bulk or total permeability to get the effective permeability of a phase. For instance, uh, what I've plotted on the left-hand side is water saturation on the x-axis and then relative permeability on the y-axis. You see that scales from zero to one. And so you could take the relative permeability at any saturation, multiply by the total permeability to get the effective permeability of that phase. So if we were to look at this image and we look at a water saturation of 40%, the relative permeability of water in the blue curve would be about 0 0.05 uh, on the relative permeability. So if bulk permeability was 100 nanodarcies, the effective permeability to water is 5 nanodarcies, 0.5 0.05 times 100 nanodarcies. Uh, I'll also mention that these curves are uh, much more intuitive above bubble point. And when you drop below bubble point, it becomes much more complicated to figure out the relative flow of each of the phases. Uh, the fractional flow curve, which is this uh, black curve, uh, is a ratio uh, of the water relative permeability to the water plus oil relative permeability and is actually synonymous with water cut. So we will use that today in history matching models. Here's the equations. Uh, if you want, uh, I can send you this presentation afterwards. So demonstrating this concept in ResFrac, I have a rel perm curve or a rel perm curve set on the left hand side, as well as some images from a simulation. So my initial water saturation in this simulation is 30% as indicated by this vertical pink line. And you can see my initial saturation here is uh, just about 30%. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, reversed it. <laughs> On the top, you'll see that oil saturation is 70%. So the inverse, if we're above bubble point, which we are, water saturation is 30%. So you can see we're at this point. And if I look at the property oil rel perm matrix, I can actually visualize in ResFrac what the effective permeability of the oil phase is, or the relative permeability of the oil phase. And I can see that orange color is about 0 0.34, which lines up on my green curve at 0 0.34 at a saturation of 30% water. If I then start producing and my oil saturation starts dropping, so it goes from this red to the orange, you can see I'm now at 60% oil saturation or 40% water saturation. And I have a commensurate change in rel perm around the fractures where I have seen depletion. And I've gone from the 0.34 to the 0 0.19, as would also be reflected in my curve. So talking maybe through some intuitions on curve shapes and what can occur, uh, what we see is that with a steeper rel perm, the fractional flow of water or the relative permeability of oil over time is going to drop faster. 
That means the fractional flow of water would increase faster over time as compared to the base case where I have equal exponents on both my oil and water phases. So if we look at the production resulting from those two rel perms, when I have the steeper oil rel perm, my water cut rises much faster than in the prior case. Uh, so I mentioned this fractional flow curve earlier. This is, will be a critical component to history matching simulations. It's very easy to calculate. You just take the relative permeability of your water phase divided by the relative permeability of the water phase plus the oil phase. And you get this nice little S curve, which tells you at any given saturation what your water cut will be. So let's look at this in practice on a more complicated case. Uh, so this is, there's a lot going on in the slide. So we'll talk through slowly what is occurring. So on my bottom left is a chart of uh, oil rate in the green on the bottom, my GOR in red, and then my water cut in blue. Uh, at very early time, what I'm looking at is that my fractures, as shown in, by water saturation on the bottom right, are water filled by that big blue or uh, red section. Sorry, this, the scale is reversed here. Uh, the red section is 100% water. So in early time, I'm actually draining my fractures and I'm not starting to produce from the matrix yet. And so uh, I could look at my water cut of my production, which at this point is about 0.35. Uh, uh, and I start as high as 0.5. Uh, I could look at 0.5 on my water cut and look at, okay, I have an effective water saturation of 50%, but that's really meaningless if I look at this image because I'm still draining water out of my fractures. What I'm interested in is if I go forward in time, indicated by this little yellow dot, to where I'm starting to drain my matrix region. And now you can see uh, water saturation has started to change along the outside of my fractures in the matrix, indicating that I'm draining from the matrix. Uh, and so if I looked at the water cut in uh, my model at that point, I'm at about 22, 21% water cut. So if I trace my way over back to my fractional flow curve and I find 20, 21%, trace down, it says I'm at 40% water saturation, which in fact matches the saturation of my matrix that I am starting to deplete, as you can see by that very faint yellow uh, alongside the fractures. So as I go through time, uh, my water cut then increases. So to try to figure out, we can progress through time and see what happens. Uh, what I notice is that my water saturation has continued to decrease alongside my fractures. However, if I look at my fractional flow, if I decrease water saturation, my water cut should be decreasing. So if I go from the dotted vertical line to the solid vertical line, I would expect the water cut to decrease in my production stream. So why is it not? Well, the answer is we have gotten into three phase flow. So if we look at GOR, we are now in the period where GOR is rising. So we're above or below bubble point. And so fractional flow as calculated no longer is accurate because we have full three phase flow and can no longer be calculated solely from uh, oil and water uh, rel perms. So when gas is coming out of solution, fractional flow gets far more complicated. And the learning is that if you're trying to match water cut in a simulation, do so prior to going below bubble point because you can have a simple two-phase fractional flow curve to match. Uh, 
And in this image, you can see again the yellow dot here as GOR is rising, I have gas saturation alongside my fractures where pressure has dropped below bubble point. So coming back to this period where I am above bubble point uh, and I have drained water out of my fractures, you can see that my water cut has stabilized somewhat before it starts to increase. This is the point in time that I want to anchor my fractional flow. So if I look at my blue curve, this is my simulation. The dotted blue curve is the data that I'm trying to match. Uh, and again, the dotted uh, curve in the green and the red indicates uh, respectively the actual oil rate and the actual GOR that I'm trying to match. So with my current simulation, my water cut is too high and my GOR is too low. My oil rate is slightly too low. So I can once again employ fractional flow. I can see at this point I'm at that 20% water cut, which tells me my effective saturation was 40%. And where I want to get to is 10%. I can see the leveling off in the actual data was 10%. So what I'll do with my fractional flow curve is I'm going to mark 10% at four or zero, 10% fractional flow at a 40% water saturation. And then I want to change my rel perms such that my fractional flow will intersect through that point, which is what I've done in this set. So I'm showing the prior rel perm curves as a dashed trend. You can see what I did is I increased my uh, water quarry exponent which adds more curvature to that water curve. And as a consequence, I've dropped my fractional flow from 0.2 to 0.1 at 40% water saturation. So if I look at the result in the simulation, this dotted trend was my prior simulation. The solid line here is my new simulation that I've used these updated rel perms. And then the dashed trends here are still my historical data. So if I clean up the image a little bit, you'll now see with my current simulation model, I am matching that uh, stabilized water cut period at about 10, 11%. However, my GORs no longer match or still do not match. So, what is going on? Well, my water cut, as I said, during the stabilized period is matching very well. So my fractional flow at my initial saturation is correct. But in later time, my GORs no longer match. You can see that my simulation has a lower GOR than my historical data and has a lower water cut. So this is very, very common that we see in simulations. What is happening here is that the oil rel perm curve is not steep enough, meaning that as we move to the right, which is during the drainage process, we are not losing enough rel perm to oil uh, to cause the difference in fractional flow. So if my oil phase is flowing too well, then I'm going to end up with a water cut that is too low. And equivalently, I will end up with a GOR that is also too low. So we had talked about this a little bit last week in terms of one of the heuristics that can be seen in rel perm. But if I were to take the most extreme oil rel perm curve possible, again, reverting to the case where I had an initial saturation of 30%, and I made almost a vertical line for my oil rel perm, you would see that as I trace down, I'm going to be on a stabilized oil decline until I hit bubble point, which is gonna cause me to kind of jump to the right. And my oil rel perm will, is going to diminish very quickly as my GOR rises 
and my water cut will increase alongside because the relative permeability of oil has dropped significantly. So I want the same heuristic uh, to happen in this simulation model. Uh, and another way that, or another diagnostic I can use is the relative uh, or the RTA, which we saw last time. So in, uh, to review this slide from last week, in the model that remains above bubble point, we can see this light blue trend, GOR remains constant. The uh, RTA signature remains very straight as indicated by the dark blue line versus in the case where we have GOR rise as oil or as gas comes out of solution, we start to see a bend upwards in the RTA trend. And that is because the relative permeability to oil alongside the fracture here is being reduced dramatically when gas comes out of solution. So if I were to compare my historical data and simulation from my data set that we were just looking at, I can see that my orange curve, which is my simulated data, is not bending upwards as aggressively or as steeply as my purple curve, which is my historical data. So again, this is exhibiting that I need a further reduction in oil rel perm as I go through time or go through depletion. Now recall that at our initial condition of 40% uh, water saturation, we were matching water cut. So as I change my oil rel perm curve, I want to maintain a fractional flow of 10% at a saturation of 40% water. So as I iterate this curve, you can see I have held that same point in my fractional flow while making my oil curve much steeper. So if my oil curve becomes steeper, you can see at 40%, my relative permeability to oil has gone from about 0.25 to 0.35. And so I need to then do a reduction, or an, uh, sorry, rather an increase in my water rel perm as well to maintain the same fractional flow at 40%. So why is this going to be effective? Again, our, our past uh, rel perm is in the, the dashed and our updated rel perm is in the solid lines. So what we are achieving is that for the same amount of saturation change, so let's say we're going from 40 to 60% water saturation, although conversely we're thinking about the oil rel perm, so that would be moving from an oil saturation of 60% to an oil saturation of 40%, we're gonna go from about 0.37 to 0.02 relative permeability to oil. Compare that to our previous curve where we were going from 0.25 to 0.06. So the change is much more dramatic in my new curve. So when I look at my simulation, the permeability to oil should be dropping much faster through time than in my previous simulation. Uh, so another consequence that we can see is that the fractional flow curve in the solid line, which is my updated rel perm curve set, is steeper than in my dashed curve. And again, note that because I already matched water saturation, at my initial water saturation, I want to hold that point when I iterate on rel perms. So voila, when I have my updated rel perms with the steeper uh, oil perm, I in fact then am able to match my data. Uh, now, admittedly this is a bit contrived because it's all simulations that I've set up to do this, but this is the consistent workflow in which we employ to history match data.
And you can also see that now my RTA is going to match up very nicely as well. So one further nuance is that in this example that we went through, GOR in both my initial simulation as well as my historical data set uh, was increasing at the same time, meaning that both my simulation case and my historical data dropped below bubble point at the same time. That's not uniformly the case, and often we have simulations where our uh, GOR rise is delayed, such as the one to the right. So here I have run two simulations with the exact same rel perms, with the exact same uh, fluid properties, and with the exact same bottom hole pressure control. However, the solid simulation increases in GOR before the dashed line simulation. So what else could be happening? What else is possible to explain why we're seeing a delayed uh, drop below bubble point in the dashed simulation? The answer is fracture conductivity. Uh, so in the dashed line simulation, I have a conductivity that is 100 times less than in the solid line simulation. So if I looked at the simulation results, uh, the color of my well bore here is showing pressure, and it is the same in both these images. So this is the same time, uh, same time within the simulation. Gray is showing the bottom hole pressure control. Both simulations are at a bottom hole pressure of about 1500 PSI. However, the fracture pressure is very different between the two simulations. In the solid line, which is the bottom image, my fracture pressure is the same pressure as my well bore. That is, that the fracture is at like a infinite conductivity fracture, meaning there is not a pressure drop along the fracture. As such, the entire matrix region that my fracture is exposed to is being drawn down at my bottom hole pressure. Compare that to my finite conductivity case, where I have a lower fracture conductivity. There is a pressure drop from the pressure in my well bore to the pressure in my fracture. So while my uh, well, well bore is at 1500 PSI, my fracture is closer to 2000 or 2500 PSI. We can also see this by plotting fracture conductivity where it's much higher in the bottom case than in the top case. And as a consequence, we can see the pressure in the matrix is being drawn down much differently. In the top case, I'm not dropping below bubble point. My fracture, my, or I'm sorry, um, my pressure is much higher. And you can see that I'm just barely breaking out gas uh, as plotted in the color scale here, which is gas saturation, that while my fracture may have gas, I am not effectively pulling down pressure in my matrix region. Contrast that to the infinite conductivity case, uh, then my gas saturation is extending much farther out into my matrix region. Uh, and so I am breaking out bubble point or breaking out GOR much earlier in that simulation. So it's an important nuance that when you go through trying to history match, we want to make sure the timing of that GOR increase is being captured in the 3D viewer, look at the pressure in your fractures versus your bottom hole. See whether you're at infinite conductivity conditions. Uh, you can see that these, I just use pre-existing fractures uh, to demonstrate this concept in a field scale simulation where you're actually simulating the fracture jobs and prop emplacement. 
the parameters to control are k naught, which is a linear multiplier to the propent conductivity, as well as propent trapping, which is going to dictate how much propent ends up in the near well region. So to review uh, some tips and guidelines, uh, we cannot emphasize enough to look at the 3D image and when you're history matching, figure out what is happening in your simulation and then look at your historical data and make an hypothesis as to what is going on. So that leads us into the scientific method, which is if we list our key observations to match and look at that historical data critically, try to explain what you're seeing in that data. For instance, at what point you're going below bubble point and then using the RTA intuitions to figure out maybe what other phenomena may be happening, whether it's competition between clusters or relative permeability impact or possibly PDP. Develop a hypothesis to match those observations in the historical data. Test those hypothesis, hypotheses in a simulation. Uh, we recommend bracketing the solution Right, so if you think that the relative permeability is curving up, or the, the, I'm sorry, if you think that the RTA is curving upwards due to a reduction in oil rel perm, try a very, very steep oil rel perm to see whether or not that will bend up enough. If you put in a vertical line for your oil rel perm and you don't get enough curvature in your RTA, then you need to go back to the drawing board and figure out a different hypothesis. Uh, so it, if that hypothesis is unsuccessful, again, look at the three image, explain to yourself why it was unsuccessful. Uh, in the example I just listed, if your hypothesis was that a very steep oil rel perm would lead to RTA curvature, yet that did not happen, look at the simulation. Did gas come out of solution in the matrix? If not, then the matrix did not see a rel perm reduction. And that's where you might need to iterate on fracture conductivity. Uh, and then finally, some of our clients as well as us on our consulting projects work on very large, very complex models with seven to 10 wells. Uh, you can get 70% of that answer if you iterate on just a single well, single stage model at first, which will run much faster, you can do many more iterations of that model and dial in your approximate rel perms to lock in, say, that water cut above uh, bubble point, uh, as well as uh, fracture conductivity parameters before going back and running that full model, which will take uh, much longer to compute. Okay, so that was a marathon as well as uh, <laughs> uh, I went through fairly quickly. So happy to take questions or discuss these various phenomena. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have, no, uh, I have no comments. I think you covered it really well. It's, um, you know, at high level, it's just, uh, here's the key thing to understand. When you go below the saturation pressure, uh, that consistently causes a drop in well productivity. And so you want the relative permeability of the um, mobile hydrocarbon phase to drop when its saturation drops. And if you're not matching the bend, you need to make sure that the steepness of that curve is greater. And that's, I think, the core concept there. Um, and that's how quite a lot of our history matches have been done has been dropping rel perm of the hydrocarbon phase when it drops below the saturation pressure. Uh, that's, that's the key takeaway, I think. Garrett, it looks like we have a question and it's how do you match capillary pressure curves for nano Darcy rock, it should be high. Oh, you know what? I just, my whole chat box just came up here and realized there was a, uh, Several questions. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, on the capillary pressure. Um, that is 
at a scale below which ResFrac is modeling. So we use rel perm curves to capture that behavior, but we're not modeling capillary or imbibition pressure. Uh, I now see a hand. Fred, can you hear me? I can. Awesome. Great presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, and I, this is my first uh, uh, office hour, so I, I, I didn't know what I was going to expect, so this was really useful, actually. Um, my question was about the integration of the fracture geometry in this piece. Uh, I know you covered calibration of the rel perm curves, uh, but does the assumption of a fracture geometry introduce any uncertainty in the calibration of the rel perm curves? Uh, yes, in a, in a couple ways. Um, first of which would be fracture height, right? So if you are contacting heterogeneous layers with different saturations, uh, you can see like in this model, I have just a uniform, pr uniform properties in the model, but that's not required, right? We could have different saturations, different permeabilities uh, in the layers in the model. So the which layers your fracture is contacting and draining from obviously shift yeah, where your effective saturation is. Uh, so uh, for instance, if you had a water, uh, high water saturation layer uh, above and you had a uh, shorter frac that's not touching it, uh, that would be much different than if you then uh, had more frac height that went into that water bearing zone, uh, which would shift you on that effective water saturation curve when you're then drawing down the reservoir. So that is certainly one case where there's a tight coupling between fracture geometry and rel perm. Uh, the other case would just be on uh, matching overall. Right, so as we talked about at the beginning, your rel perm uh, is actually getting you to an effective permeability. Right, so you're multiplying that rel perm by your total permeability uh, to get the effective permeability of that, that phase. We're then using that effective permeability to match the slopes on RTA, which is what we had talked about last week. But the slope of that RTA is proportional to not only the square root of permeability, but also to fracture area. So as your fracture mechanics and fracture area changes, that total permeability that you're trying to match to using the slope of RTA uh, would be different as well. Makes sense, thanks a lot. One thing, it's a little bit unrelated, but it harkens back to when you were doing your, your initial sales pitch for ResFrac. You were talking about uh, looking at a parent and child uh, uh, well set up. Um, mm -hmm. we, we as we're doing our models, we from our managers certainly get a lot more questions of, well, can you show me how the, the degree, uh, or can you show me qualitatively, not quantitatively, but qualitatively somehow, how well the fracks are connecting with each other? And how could we do that? How, how is there a quanti qualitative way to show that, you know, by, by each, how each fracture is connecting through maybe prop in area uh, or, or fracture connectivity of how, how, how that degree of connectedness is, is occurring uh, between fractures of, of you know, parent-child or, or zipper fract wells? Yeah, great question. Um, there's a couple qualitative directions I might take. And then, of course, quantitatively, there's a couple things you could do as well, which, which you may have already tried as well. Uh, on the qualitative side, uh, coming back to that concept of infinite conductivity, Uh, and in, and this isn't the best image of it, but an infinite conductivity, actually, I think I have one down here and back up. 
Right. Yeah. So an infinite conductivity fracture is going to be at the same pressure as your bottom hole, whereas finite conductivity, uh, you'll see a gradient. So typically what you, we would see in a simulation is that you would have constant pressure in your uh, propped pa uh, propent pack in a fracture. And then when you start reducing below a critical propent concentration, uh, you would start introducing a gradient. And then of course the unpropped regions of the fracture, you would also be at a much higher pressure. And so in the Viz tool, what I would look at is, does that constant frac pressure extend all the way from well to well? Or do I in fact have this area of finite conductivity in between my two infinite conductivity regions? Does that kind of make sense? Yes. Uh, so that, that would be a qualitative way in which I would, would look at that data. Uh, quantitatively, of course, you could just turn off and on wells in the model and see how much of, a, of interference you, you experience. Um, uh, yeah, okay. yeah that, that one's a little more obvious. The first one was, is probably more I was looking for because it's hard to imagine another well next to each other if you don't actually have the fracks there and showing, you know, that difference, you know, uh, of the pressures. I think that's, that's a, an important thing. And, and what I was trying to get at was, was there a, a way in the Viz tool to basically watch it? Uh, you know, it would, be, it would be really nice in the Viz tool to be able to watch this in a movie to where you could see these, you know, in a zipper frack, you can see these fracks connecting up and then drawing down, you know, by, by, the, by, the, um, uh, by the cluster. You know, if you looked at one cluster or multiple clusters in a stage in different uh, panels, you could then see those being fracked, connected, and then you can see the drawdown, uh, you know, simultaneously. That would be, that would be something to be really nice. Cool. Yeah, we can, uh, we can think about how we might visualize that. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so about rel perm, I have a question about the rel perm in the fractures. Um, mm -hmm. I'm assuming the rel perm curve you're talking about is for the reservoir. And if we apply a different rel perm in the fracture and in the reservoir, uh, which one will dominate the flow behavior? And um, do we use that for the case three match? Yeah, it's a tough one because they're going in series, right? So, uh, so it, it kind of depends on what's the limiting factor, I think. Um, what we have found is to use very uh, generic close to X curves in the fractures. Uh, and this is, we feel somewhat justified in that, uh, you know, that's about as good, uh, certainly in a open crack, you'll have an X curve, right? Because there's, <laughs> there's no capillary pressure to be, be had, but you're just flowing through effectively a pipe. Um, and then the thought is in prop and pack, um, the idea of pumping prop is to put in a super high conductive pathway to hold that fracture open. And so we would expect that to be as, cl as close to X curves as you could get in, uh, like it'd be like flowing through a sand pack, right, on, on the surface. Uh, and so we, we feel that X curves or close to X curves uh, would is the most appropriate way uh, to model that. Yeah, uh, maybe I'll maybe I'll comment on that because there is an important reservoir scale reason to why that's done. Um, so, first off, when we see these wells bottom hole pressure going below saturation pressure, we usually see GOR start increasing quite soon, and that requires that not only is the bottom hole pressure below the saturation pressure, but the pressure is below the saturation pressure out in the fracture and out in, you know, at least near the fracture in the formation. So that means that the fractures have to have pretty darn good conductivity. Um, and secondly, when we, what he's showing here is 
that usually these lines uh, do tend to have a, a y-intercept close to zero. So that also suggests that the fractures have quite good conductivity. So I don't necessarily believe that they're 100% infinite conductivity features from the beginning of production, but I think they have they usually have pretty good conductivity. Um, and, and so what that means, first off, is that if, if the fracture was infinite conductivity, the rel perm wouldn't matter um, because it would have such high conductivity that it's negligible. Um, but let's, let's take a situation where it did matter. Uh, maybe the fracture is pretty high conductivity, but not totally infinite conductivity. And uh, maybe you do something really aggressive, like you say, oh, I think that the, um, the brooks Corey exponent for, for oil flow in the prop and pack is five. You know, if you do five, then what you're going to find is extraordinarily nonlinear, well perm to the oil saturation. Um, you know, that would that would mean basically like if your, you know, if your residual oil saturation was 0.2, uh, and you had 0.3, you know, you'd be looking at like a 10 to the minus four, 10 to the minus five type well perm. All right, so huge reduction. Here's the problem with that model. If you do something like that, what you'll find is that the RTA behavior becomes dominated by changes in saturation. So maybe your oil saturation starts at point 0.1, then it goes to point 0.2, then it goes to point 0.3, then it goes to point 0.6. Well, the change in rel perm, if you have a brooks Corey exponent of five, is going to be like many, many orders of magnitude. Um, and you can see all kinds of wacko things on an RTA plot that nobody's ever seen on an RTA plot. <laughs> so that's the reason, is, is pretty quickly when we started running these models, I'm making RTA plots of data and I tried out higher brooks Corey exponents. And what I found is just the data looked wacko and it would just bend all over in weird places and weird ways. So the fact that that doesn't ever happen, that the RTA plots are very consistently shaped across all shale plays, which is they start straight and then they kind of bend up. That's pretty much 80, 90% of it, uh, tells me that we don't have really weird nonlinearities happening due to multi-phase flow in the fractures. Uh, and so that's why we found when we started going to much lower brooks Corey exponents of like, you know, we used two or 1.5. You know, that's not quite a, an X curve, but it's, you know, it's pretty darn, pretty darn high, high, high uh, you know, it's a pretty, a pretty low exponent. Um, we're getting results that match up with field data. So that's, that's why we've gone with that. And we don't really ever change those as part of our history matching procedure. That's not to say that you, you can't, you know, maybe there is some good reasons to do that that I don't know about, but when we do history matching, we pretty much just leave it alone and, and leave those uh, on their default values. Sounds good. So let the reservoir dominate. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. I think so. Because otherwise, what you just see is you just see these really unpredictable and kind of complicated nonlinearities um, in the happening in the production data because of these changes in fracture rel perm that we just don't see in real life. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Gary. Oh, and then I'll also mention, you know, of course, you know, a, a crack or a propped bed of particles is in fact a situation where theoretically you should expect a low Brooks Corey exponent. So it's not uh, surprising. It's, it's what you would expect. Uh, so there was a question on uh, the not, the oil rate control and dropping below bubble point. Um, Let's see if we have a good image of it. Uh, you can see in this image, maybe I'll fast forward a little bit. Uh, there is a pressure in the fractures as well as a pressure in the matrix. And the uh, if you were controlling on an oil rate uh, or total fluid rate, then the model is going to specify a total volume of fluid as a control and then estimate the pressure that is required to produce that volume of fluid. If you have higher permeability rock, uh, you don't need as low a pressure to produce the same volume. Uh, so as a consequence, if you were trying to history match and change your permeability in the matrix during production, if that permeability was too high to begin with and you specified an oil rate control, then the model is going to uh, predict 
that you don't need to pull down the pressure very much in the matrix in order to get the same amount of production. So as a consequence, you would likely uh, remain above bubble point if your permeability was say like two orders or three orders of magnitude too high or something like that. So that's why we recommend at least starting the history match with bottom hole pressure to get you in the correct ballpark on permeability. And then if you want to switch to an oil rate or a total rate control uh, to make the plots look better, <laughs> uh, then you're able to do so uh, once that permeability is in the right range. Uh, let's see, question here is increase in pore pressure accounted for uh, in adjacent fracture matrix blocks as leak off occurs. Uh, yes, again, I'll use this image. Um, well, pretty hard to see here, uh, but the matrix cells right around the fracture during injection will actually have an elevated pressure. Uh, and that is a consequence of water or injection leaking off from the fractures into the matrix. And also, I'll reiterate or just state that um, ResFrac is using the 1D submesh method to subgrid the elements, the matrix elements that contain fracture elements. And so, even though the matrix mesh appears coarse, uh, it is being subgridded very close to the fracture. So, that elevation of pressure uh, near the fracture is accounted for in a more rigorous way that actually does account for the small scale changes in pressure, even if that's not necessarily visible in the 3D image. Yeah, so you can kind of see it in, in this image, the tips of the fracture, you know, were raised to a pressure above the matrix pressure, uh, but then didn't, you know, there must have been a constriction on this fracture or something where it didn't drain effectively afterwards, and so it remains elevated in those elements next to the fracture as well as the fracture itself. Um, not a great example, but you can see a piece of that uh, phenomenon. Okay, well, that brings us to the end of the hour. Um, I'm happy to pass these slides uh, to anyone who would like them. Just email uh, myself uh, here at garrett at resfrac.com and I can uh, send you a copy of the slides, uh, which I recommend going through in kind of a more nuanced way or detailed way. Uh, I moved pretty quickly and I tried to make uh, these uh, interpretable even without a presentation. Okay. Uh, yes, water saturation will also increase in the matrix elements offsetting a fracture during injection when leak off occurs. Uh, so mass is conserved in all ResFrac models. So if leak off is occurring, then water saturation would increase in those elements being leaked off into. Okay, well, thanks again, everyone for, for joining. Um, I'm happy to stay on for a little bit longer, but that will conclude the uh, official portion of, uh, of the presentation and question session today.